and welcome back everyone today we're going to be going over the third round game that i put played today in the fide grand prix here in berlin now as you know i lost the first game against levon and i drew the second game against andre Asipenko. and my third unique opponent was none other than the Russian player Grigory Oparin. Now, I have played Mr. Oparin a few times in the past, primarily in Gibraltar. He's a very solid player, uh, has a pretty set opening repertoire, and tends to be very classical. So keeping that in mind, combined with everything else that's going on, um, I decided I was going to have a little bit of fun today. So the game starts with d4. So I play knight to f6, c4, and now I play g6, opting to play the king's Indian. Now, the first real surprise occurs when Grigori plays knight c3. In the past, he has always played the Fionchetto variation with knight f3, bishop g7, g3, castles, bishop g2, and castles. Again, I had obviously looked at this, but he chose not to play that. Instead, he plays knight c3. So I go bishop g7, and now he plays e4. I go d6, bishop e2, castles, and h4. And at this point, I was obviously very unhappy because, first of all, I thought I would surprise Grigori. I have not played the king's Indian in, I believe, five years. Last time I think I played it might have been against Fabiano, but that wasn't a rapid game, so a much different situation. Uh, those of you who, are, who want to be very specific on it, that game that I'm referring to is against Fabiano in the London Chess Classic in 2018, and I believe a rapid or a blitz game. Anyway, h4 is played. So now I play c5. Now here I, I had a little bit of a case of deja vu. Now e5 is a move, and after h5, knight a6, h5, knight c5, h6, bishop h8, you'll notice that after bishop g5, the starting to look very similar to a game that I had with the white pieces against Alexander Grishchuk in the first leg of the FIDE Grand Prix, also held here in Berlin with this pawn in h6. So I had a big decision to make here, and when I was thinking about this during the game, there were a few things that were in my mind. It was not actually so much about which variation to play. It was about which variation would give me the best chances to A, surprise Grigori, and B, create a mess or create counterplay where all the results were in play. And so the reason that I chose not to play e5 is that I felt that after e5, d5, knight, a6, even after h5, knight, c5, h6, bishop, h8, even a move like queen, c2 here, a5, bishop, e3, the structure is very, very stable here for white. There's not a lot going on. Everything hinges upon the central break with c6 and c takes d5. And therefore, I felt that even though this line is not something Grigori has played all that frequently, because the pawn structure is so set, it's going to be very hard to complicate matters. Therefore, I chose not to play e5. Instead, I go c5, d5, and now I have my second second big decision here, which was to play e6 or to play b5. Now, again, I don't know if this is the exact position as in the game between Maxim Vashila Grav and Peter Savidler, but there was a game in, in the Sinkfield Cup which was very similar to this with b5 takes, a6, and then a move like a4. Uh, I believe that Maxim was white and won that game, although, again, the people who have looked at that game or the people who are going to go, go fact-check, I should say, uh, whether I'm actually telling the truth or not, uh, um, obviously, they'll be able to write in the comments and let me know if I'm right or wrong. But I do recall there was a game, I think, between Maxim and Peter, so I thought, once again, two topical top grandmasters have been playing it. I should try to avoid it. So instead, I play e6 here, and we get the classic Benoni structure. So h5 is played instantly. I take back, and now he takes with the e-pawn here. Now, if you take with a c-pawn, there are ideas like rook to e8, putting pressure on e4. Maybe there's also even a move like b5 uh, with some ideas like, say, bishop b5, knight e4 takes, and queen a5 check, hitting the king and the bishop. Um, and if white goes queen e2 takes, knight d6, queen d7. Black should be okay here because white has pushed the pawn, and he's really lacking in development here with all these pieces on their original squares. So instead, Grigori takes with the e-pawn. Now I go rook e8, and he plays h6. Again, all these moves are being played instantly, which is sort of... Uh, it's good and bad. On the one hand, I know that this means I'm playing the best moves because everybody looks at the absolute top computer lines. On the other hand, it's very annoying because obviously my opponent is just a computer. He's not a human. So I played bishop h8 here, bishop g5, played instantly, and now I go queen b6. And at this point, I actually started to feel very optimistic because one of the things that black tries to do very oftentimes in this uh, Benoni structure is he tries to play knight e4. So for example, if I go back, let me just set up a more normal position here. Let's say castles, knight f3, c5, d5, e6. Let's say there's some capture, rook e8. Say white plays move like bishop f4. Black always has ideas like knight e4 in this situation as well. Obviously a little bit different because the pawn's on h6, but the theme exists in, in, in all these scenarios. So back to the game. After queen b6, I started feeling very optimistic. I thought that Grigori would probably start to think here because already it feels like we're, we're out of theory. Much to my surprise, Grigori played b3 instantly. So now I played knight e4, and again, in retrospect, maybe this isn't the best move. There are a lot of options here. I can play knight e4, I can play bishop f5, maybe even knight a6 right away. Again, 
I'll probably take a look at this and we'll see what objectively is going on down the road. But I was pretty happy with 94 at the board. I figured, first of all, Gregorius in his preparation. So I might as well play the most logical moves. Additionally, if we look at this position, black is a little bit less space here. You're kind of cramped on the king side, cramped in the center of the board. White's pawns control a lot more territory. So as I've said in many other videos, one of the things that you want to do if you have less space, there are two, two options. Number one, you look for pawn breaks. Are there any pawn breaks? I don't have b5 there's nothing there's nothing really happening in the center of the board here so i don't have a pawn break so if you don't have pawn breaks the second thing you look to do is you look to trade off some minor pieces because then you have less pieces and more space for limited pieces again this is generally a russian russian theme uh, from the russian school of chess so i play knight e4 so i figured why not it follows the themes rook e4 king f1 played here instantly again very surprising move to me not something i was expecting i was expecting a move like rook c1 maybe maybe knight f3 in castles but instead gregory plays king f1 showing that he had prepared this variation for somebody in a recent event i don't know who exactly but someone so now here i play knight a6 now the reason i went knight a6 here well first of all i can't take the rooks after queen a1 there's a very nasty lolly checkmate on g7 if i play a move like rook e5 white has f4 i'll lose the rook or get mated and if i go rook d4 knight f3 let's just say i play a move like knight d7 after knight takes pawn takes white can do the rook lift with rook h4 win the pawn on d4 and this position is completely winning for white so therefore i can't take the rook so now i thought well what am i trying to do i have to somehow develop these three pieces on the queen side now if i go bishop f5 for example there are issues like g4 here and the bishop has to retreat either to d7 or c8 if i go to c8 it doesn't really make sense now even if i even if i move the knight my rook is still going nowhere because the bishop has no squares so i don't really want to go to f5 now i go to d7 now the knight has to go to a6 so why not just put the knight here right away and the other idea is knight d7 but i didn't really like knight d7 because i thought after knight f3 it's a little bit hard to develop anyway if i go knight f6 here white can go bishop d3 rook e8 now is a very tricky move doing the rook lift again with rook h4 it stops knight e4 he also has rook f4 to put pressure on the knight on f6 long term and again i wasn't sure if this is okay or not but it feels feels hard to play it feels very very hard to play even after moves like bishop d7 let's say white goes rook c1 this rook f4 is always lurking and my pieces are really kind of stuck here i'd love to stack the rooks but if i put the rook on e7 i walk into a pin potentially so it's very hard to play i just don't have much space the bishop on h8 is dead the knight on f6 can't move the rooks can't stack i don't have pawn breaks it's just a very cramped position here so therefore i played knight a6 and bishop d3 is played and this was really the critical moment of the game in this situation i think i used about 25 minutes before playing the move that is actually losing on the spot so initially after bishop d3 my idea was to go rook to e8 here and basically ask white what is he doing if he plays a move like rook c1 i can go knight b4 here and if a3 i actually have knight a2 and the knight jumps to c3 and if he goes bishop b1 here for example i can go queen a5 attacking the pawn on a2 and now if white goes a4 it looks kind of awkward but i can just play a6 and b5 my knight has a great outpost here on b4 and it can no longer be attacked by a pawn from c3 or a3 so after bishop d3 i play bishop to g4 now as i said the reason that i went for this was based on a pure miscalculation in retrospect as i said rook e8 rook c1 and then maybe knight b4 maybe even just bishop d7 both these moves would have been playable as I, as I alluded to earlier with this knight before line it would have been quite promising and i definitely should have gone for this but instead i played bishop g4 f3 and now i played rook d4 now the reason i played this was because i did a lot of calculations here first and foremost if white takes the bishop i go knight b4 rook h3 and now i can go knight takes d3 if white takes the knight on d3 we trade the rooks and then i win the rook on a1 and i'll bring the rook in and there really are no threats on the dark square so the bishop is covering f6 g7 and h8 very nicely from the square at the other end of the board so this was the first thing i saw and then if white plays a move like knight f3 i have a very nasty knight to f2 forking the queen and forking the rook here and if white goes queen e2 for example i can just play rook e4 queen takes knight bishop takes rook again i'm going to stack the rooks on the e-file dark squares are covered by the bishop on a1 so this should be completely winning so i did all these calculations and then i moved on to the other line which is played in the game which is queen e2 and so now i went bishop d7 rook to e1 knight to b4 now when i played when i was calculating these lines the first thing i looked at was queen e7 and i realized after knight takes d3 if white takes the bishop on d7 i just take the rook on e1 and if white tries to get really tricky with bishop f6 hoping for bishop takes queen takes and mate on g7 next move I don't take the bishop on f6 I can simply take the rook on e1 and after bishop takes h8 here I can go knight to d3 queen to f6 and I very quietly 
just walk the king away to f8. And now after queen g7, I can go king e7, queen f6, king e8, and this is completely winning for black. So it's a very neat trick. Now, the reason this doesn't work is that unfortunately, unfortunately here, white has the crushing move, bishop takes g6. Now, I did actually see this move in my calculations, but the problem is, and this does happen sometimes when you're not doing perfect calculations, is I simply forgot that after queen e7 here, if I go queen c7, white has this very nasty move, rook e6, and my knight is on b4 and not a6. If my knight was magically, say, on a6 here, I can take and block with f7, and of course, queen takes, knight takes. But again, when you're doing deep calculations, sometimes you forget exactly where the pieces are, and unfortunately, I simply forgot that after pawn takes queen e7, queen c7, rook e6, I can't take the rooks, I lose my queen. And if I don't take the rooks, I play rook e8, for example, white has rook takes g6, pawn takes rook, and h7 is a very, very nasty checkmate here. King has no squares. So I was really upset at this point because I already don't really have a way back. I can try to play bishop e5, for example, but after bishop e3, the rook is trapped on d4. And again, I can probably play on like queen a5 and bishop d4. I do have a little bit of play with the wooden shield, the bishop on d4. But again, long term, due to the back rank checkmate threats, white should eventually be able to untangle with knight h3 f2 or knight h3 and knight to g5. So again, I could have done this, but I figured at this point, you know what? I might as well just go for it. So I play knight before, bishop takes pawn, and now I play knight takes pawn. I cannot, as I said, I can't take because also after queen e7, bishop f5, there's another amazing move g4 here, which is simply winning for white. If I go check, king g2, white's threatening checkmate on e6. And if I play a move like rook f8 here, there's queen e6, rook f7, queen c8, rook f8, rook e8. And again, I'm getting checkmated here on the king's side. The queen and the knight, the bishop and the rook, all four of these pieces are way too far away from the action, and I would lose here. So this is very upsetting to see at the board. And once again, in a situation that was reminiscent of my game against Levon early in the tournament, I was debating, do I want to resign here? Do I want to play on? What do I want to do? So when all is said and done, I end up playing knight takes d5. Now, the computer briefly says that after pawn takes queen e7, there is rook takes d5. However, once again, this rook e6 move is crushing. If I take the rook on e6, white has queen takes e6, king f8, and then bishop bishop to e7, king to e8 is played here, bishop f6, king f8, queen e7, king g8, and now, actually, sorry, I'm wrong. In this position, white actually has a force with bishop g7, takes, takes, queen e7, takes, and I think after queen h8, king f7, rook h7, somehow white is winning here, although white can also just take all the material, and white simply has an extra rook here, so this would be good enough. Again, I knew this, this, this something like this has to be winning. However, after rook e6, rook d1, king e2, once again, this idea of rook takes g6 followed by h7 mate is simply unstoppable. If I go bishop e8, there's a very cool line, rook to f6, threatening the ladder checkmate. If I take the rook, white takes with the queen, and again, or sorry, white takes with the, white, sorry, white doesn't take. White goes queen e6 check, bishop f7, queen takes f6, and now there's queen g7 checkmate. An amazing computer line. Now, maybe I should have tried to do this anyway in the game, because whether my opponent would have seen all these moves remains to be seen. But at any rate, this is winning after rook e8, king takes d1. There's simply a checkmate that's unstoppable on g7 here. So this would have been an incredible, incredible way for Grigori to win. So I decided, you know what, it's probably losing, but I might as well play knight takes pawn. And now here, Grigori misses a couple easy ways to win. The first and foremost way would be to go bishop b1, because now if I play knight to c3 here, white can go queen to e7. If I say move the bishop to c6, white can play bishop h7 check, king h7, queen takes f7, bishop g7, queen g7 checkmate. And if I don't move the bishop, let's say I take the bishop here on, on b1, after queen d7, white has the idea of rook e8 mate. And additionally, white also has the idea of rook takes b1. So this would have been the end of the game. So if, if, if Grigori played bishop b1, I probably would have resigned the game here. But after thinking for probably about a good five or six minutes, Grigori shocked me by playing this move, bishop takes h7. Also worth noting, bishop f5 is also winning here. So takes king h7. And now after queen c2, f5, white takes the knight. And I have this move, bishop e5. And now white is still quite a bit better, but there's no clear-cut way to attack and, in fact, win the game. And additionally, my rook is coming into the game. My bishops are very active. And white has a lack of development here with the king on f1, the two rooks, and the knight on g1. So it gets very tricky to play. So here, Grigori plays knight e2. Now, I did realize during the game that knight h3 probably was still good for white, but I think for Grigori, psychologically, at this point, he realized he had misplayed it, and he suddenly realized there's a lot of counterplay, 
and he starts to go wrong. He plays knight to e2. It's also worth noting f4 is apparently playable, but after bishop b5, king to f2, bishop d3, queen c1, c4, I open up this diagonal. There are double checks everywhere. It looks really, really scary. Computer still says after queen e3, black can take, bishop f4, bishop d4, knight f3, and white's slightly better. Again, can someone find this over the board after messing up a completely winning position? Pretty difficult to play. But this still should be good for white. Again, I, as I said, at this point, Gregory, I think, realized he had messed it up. And now he starts trying to play logical moves. So he goes knight e2. And now I play queen a6 here. Rook g8 was also a move that I had considered here. But I didn't do it because I thought after knight d4 here, if I take queen d2, white should be better. Computer actually says after bishop b5, king f2, d3. There's quite a bit of counterplay. But I felt that this probably was still quite bad. So instead, I go queen a6 here. Grigori goes king f2. Worth noting, by the way, rook takes d5 does not work here because white is queen c4. I can't move the rooks. They rook d2. There's queen f7, king h8, bishop f6, trade, and then checkmate. So I can't move the rook from d5 here. And if I play the move queen to c6, for example, now white can go knight to f4 and disaster strike. My rook is stuck here. If I move it, there's mate again. If I take the knight on f4, there's now rook e7. And again, I'm getting checkmated uh, in a variety of ways. Something like this is also checkmate. So if, if I take the pawn on d5 after queen c4, the only try here would be to play bishop c6. Again, hoping for knight f4 because I have bishop b5 with the pin. But after bishop c6 here, white can simply go f4 here. And when I move the bishop away to h8, white has knight c3. And again, with the rook coming to e7 now and the, the bishop b5 square or the b5 square covered by the knight on c3, this is simply game over. And I'm, once again, the king on h7 is going to get checkmated. So I can't do this. So therefore, I play queen a6, pinning the knight on e2. King f2 is played, and now I go queen to d3. And I was very happy when I got to this position because now I realize it's going to be very, very hard for white to play. White cannot take the rook on d4 here because then I take back with check on d4. And once the king moves, bye-bye birdie. I just take the queen on c2 and win the game. So here, Grigori could have played queen to c1. But again, at this point, I was already getting very optimistic because now I can go bishop to b5 here. And after knight takes d4, I can simply take bishop e3. And now I have this amazing move, pawn to f4, which is actually crushing because white can't really move the bishop. You can't go to d2 because you, you would hang your king. And if you don't move the bishop, say you go rook h3, I just take the bishop. If you take the queen... I can take back with the bishop, and I have these beautiful bishops on d4 and b5. The pawn also covers g3, so the only way to stop checkmate is rook e3. And after bishop takes, queen takes, takes, king e3, rook e8. Black simply is an extra bishop and should be winning quite nicely. So I started to get really optimistic here. I was kind of hoping that he would go queen c1. But Grigori, I think at this point, he started to realize that everything has slipped away and very pra practically, he just trades the queens and goes rook d1 here. And at this point, I realized that now we've trans transpositioned into an end game, but with the two bishops, even though I'm down a pawn here, this pawn on h6 is kind of a weakness as opposed to a strength, and I should be able to draw. So I play a5 here again. I want to activate this rook. I can put it on e8, but again, if white goes rook d3, rook e3, exactly what is happening here should be enough for a draw, but it doesn't seem like the most practical way to play. So why not just go a5 and try to rip open this a file and activate the rook uh, down towards a2. So I go a5, rook d3 is played, I play a4, and now Grigori makes sort of the, I don't want to say final mistake, but the misses the last chance to create counterplay, plays rook e3. Now during the, during the game, I thought f4 was still a try. I felt that after bishop b2, rook e3. Um, it's worth noting I cannot take on b3 here because white, white can make the check. And after king g6, take on b3 and b7 is weak. Um, additionally, white can also go rook b3 as well, hitting both the pawn and the bishop. So this would have been quite bad. So the only move that I can play here is rook e8. But now after rook to e7, trade, a takes b3, a takes b3. I should be able to draw with bishop e8 because I, I saw this line with bishop d6, bishop f7. And if bishop e5, we trade, I take. And after knight a4 takes e6, it looks like white has the wide peepos. But after king h6, e7, I have bishop a4, knight e6. And at the very least, I can go king g6 because if knight c7, I have king f7 to cover the square. And white can also take on c5, but after bishop... I think bishop e8 is probably safest, knight b7, I go king f7, knight d6, king e7, knight f5, king f6, knight e3, bishop d7, and this is a theoretical draw. 
So f4 would have been the last try. Instead, Grigori plays rook e3, and now after pawn takes in rook a2, white really has no chance here because if you go f4, it's now too little too late because I have bishop d4, and you lose the rook on e3 because of the pin from the rook on a2 towards the king on f2, so you can't capture. And white has nothing better than to move the king to g1. If you go to e1, it's more of the same. I just check. If king d2, I check. If white goes to d3 on the off chance, there is bishop b5 checkmate. And if white tries king d1, I just do the same thing. I check, check, king b1, check. And I just check the king all over the board until eventually he has to go towards g1, which he does in the game. And now I play rook a1 check, king f2, rook a2, and we agree to a draw here. So a very, very tricky and complicated game. Objectively, I was definitely lost at one point, but the gods smiled on me today uh, with Grigori playing this bishop takes h7 move and not finding the win. And we survive. We get the draw with the King's Indians. So it's a, it's a fairly good result, all things being said. Although I would have liked to have more chances to maybe try and win the game. But I definitely can't complain after what transpired. So that's going to be our recap of today's third round game. I will be playing tomorrow against Levon Aronian. But before we do go, I do want to stress once again, you guys, I'm trying to do my best to play. Uh, it was another very long, very, very restless night for me last night. I sort of alluded to it in a brief interview I did earlier today where um, there were some issues with Twitch and potentially doing interviews for World Chess. And if Twitch so felt like it, they could potentially try and permanently ban me if any of these interviews found their way onto the platform. So it was definitely a restless night, but on the on the bright side, there were a couple of fans who were at the playing site today. And before I do go, I want to show you a gift that one of them gave to me. So I guess I'll just open it. Um, give me one second, you guys, and I'll show you. Pretty pretty cool gift. Um, it was from from a fan, and it's like this this wood block. You can sign, kind of see it's my name, but it, but it also it, it, I can push push out the uh, push out the wood tiles as well. But just so you guys see it. That is my name. And so it was a very nice gift that was given to me today. And, you know, once again, big shout out to all the fans who, um, all the fans, actually, I can pull it out like you see you see right there. This is even better. Um, but big shout out to all the fans who are here in Berlin. Thank you for the love and support. Obviously, all of you guys on YouTube as well. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the video. And I will be playing Levon tomorrow. So once again, I'll be back to do another recap um, once again. All right. Have a great one, you guys. See you tomorrow. Uh, Hikaru, you managed to escape, it feels like, in this game. So how did it feel for you? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a very interesting uh, opening by Rigori to play this h4, h5 idea. I mean, I was not expecting it, of course, because I haven't played the King's Indian in probably like five years, so a little surprising. Yeah, I mean, I was very upset with myself because essentially I blundered one move. This whole line with bishop g6, I just forgot that on takes, uh, queen e7, queen c7, there's, there's rook e6. Uh, I simply just forgot that this move existed. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I had to play this knight takes d5, and then Grigori didn't play bishop b1. Similar to kind of the Levon game, I mean, he plays bishop h7, and then I got play. If he'd gone bishop b1, I mean, there's a good chance I would have just resigned again. But, uh, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes you have to get lucky. So, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting game. Obviously, I'm happy with the result, all things being said. But, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, you said also that you didn't play uh, King's Indian, so it was some kind of special preparation for this game. Were you affected by the tournament situation? Well, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll be blunt. I mean, it has almost nothing to do with the tournament situation whatsoever. It has to do with everything else that's happened on the internet over the last couple of days. Um, you know, it's like, uh, obviously this is going to end up on YouTube, but not on Twitch. And, you know, in this, this world we live in, not, not to be political, but the world that we live in these days with media, I mean, they can find reasons to, um, to cancel you, do whatever they want, over the smallest of things. So uh, that's been much more on my mind than, um, than the tournament itself. So, I mean, really, when you ask me about the tournament, how, how I feel, I'm just trying to play chess and find some inspiration because uh, there are other things that are very, very unpleasant and, and I'm pretty upset about. Yeah, I mean, um, let's say all these things are affecting you during the game, affecting your tournament. Let's say, how is it how it's possible during the game literally to forget about everything? Do you have some kind of... A yeah, advice yeah. I mean, I think the main thing is uh, in the moment you just try to you just try to find good moves. And, and the one thing is, I've spent my whole life playing chess, so it's it's quite easy at least to to look for good moves. I mean, obviously when the game starts going the wrong way, I mean it's very easy to be negative. But at the end of the day, I've I've spent my whole life doing it, so it comes natural. And I think uh, that's that's all you really can do. So I just try to do my best. Yeah. Okay. So. And we are wishing also you all the best in the next rounds. It's still three rounds to go, at least. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Haru, welcome back to Berlin. Today is a very special day. It's the birthday of Yasser Seravan. Would you be interested in publishing the book of his best anecdotes and stories one day? 
Um, I mean, if, if I knew if I knew all of them, I would. I think, I mean, obviously, happy birthday to Yasser. He's been a legend on the U.S. chess scene for many, many years now, uh, since, since even before I started playing. So it's just, I would just wish him the best. And uh, I, I mean, I think if somebody doesn't publish a, a book of either his stories or quotes, uh, it would be a real pity for the world of chess. Hopefully he does it, though. Hopefully he does it. He hasn't done it yet, but hopefully he does it himself. Yeah, that's what we wish for. Switching from one tough topic to another, do you have any particular opinion about Sergei's ban from competitive chess for six months? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very tough situation, of course. I mean, for me personally, <laughs> I mean, now that I'm, I'm in my own sort of, sort of uh, situation as well, you know, I, I, I would say what I said, I think, before. Obviously, I don't agree with Sergei on a personal level. I mean, I, I think it's uh, abhorrent. It's very, very sad. I mean, people are dying, obviously, uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, but at the same time, I mean, chess is chess, and I think when, again, when you choose to cancel somebody over their personal opinions, I mean, I, it doesn't really sit right with me because it doesn't have anything to do with the game itself. I mean, when you play the game of chess, you play the game. So even though I don't agree, and obviously I have pretty strong opinions about wh what Sergei has said, I mean, I, I still think it's, uh, I think it's wrong to, to basically take away his spot or ban him over what he said because you should separate politics and chess. Chess Federation of Russia might appeal. Do you think they have any chance to reverse the Fidesz sentence? Um, I mean, I think it's about 0% chance. Uh, I don't think there's, there's any way it will be reversed. I mean, obviously, again, I think the, the general sentiment is, is pretty strong one way. And um, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they're happy to see it. So yeah, I, I don't think it's going to change. Um, but I think it's, that's a very dangerous precedent um, going forward. Thank you so much, and good luck for the incoming games. Thank you. Appreciate it.